Tally, you were a psychologist for a while, and you're an intelligent man. Apply some of your analytical skills to this question. Why are you such a big hit? You've made 60 movies, but in terms of Kojak, which is broadcast pretty much around the world, you're mobbed just about everywhere you go, all through Europe, the Orient, even behind the Iron Curtain. Analyze your own success. Oh, you notice I didn't interrupt you when you were saying those nice things about me. Uh, I don't think I can take too much credit for that. You know, I was the reluctant dragon when it comes to doing television. Of course, I prefer traveling the world and doing these motion pictures all over. But when they finally did nail me, <laughs> period, uh, I did the television show. And I realized the power of the medium. And that's one of the rewards of finally going into TV is that the recognition was so quick as compared to, you know, I've done over 60 major Yeah, but major what are they pictures. recognizing? Why, why is Telly embraced by all cultures? Why is Telly Savalas the hit? You're talking about the medium. Well, that's one thing. But why are you the, the man, the human being? Well, I don't know. I guess I've always had a, a love affair with people. And one of my major pursuits in life was chasing them and talking to them and observing them. Now it just makes my job a little bit easier because they recognize me and they come up to me. And uh, nothing has changed. I treat it with affection and understanding. And I'm not that sophisticated where I don't enjoy my success. And one of the great enjoyments is being able to share it with a lot of people. Could you go back to the simple life? You grew up in a home where at, at times your father had money and at times you had nothing. And at times he had money and at times he had nothing. Now you've got a lot of money. Could you go and could you go off and live without much money now or do you really have to have bread? Let me tell you something quickly, Billy. If I wind up at the end of the year, zero, or nobody anything, I'm way ahead. Money to me is to be utilized and spent. So I don't consider that. As far as uh, the simplicity of life, you know, one thing I got going for me is a continuity of personality. And I'm not dumb enough where success, commercial success, is going to blow me out of proportion. I'm on a merry-go-round. But I'm smart enough to know that it's a bubble, and it's going to burst. And when it does, I'll go back to doing what I was doing and tell everybody how I used to be a movie star. <laughs> All right, what were you doing? Now, you were a teacher for a while, and you worked at the UN. Let's talk about your teaching days. What did you teach, psychology? But you mustn't be that impressed with only those two jobs. It's also true that I drove trucks. It's also true that my father was a millionaire and sent me out with a shoe shine box on the street in New York. It's also true that I worked in restaurants. I did it all, baby, and I'm ready to do it again. You're not afraid. You're not afraid of anything. No, sir. In fact, I resent anything that robs you of the unpredictability of tomorrow. Money has a tendency to do that. Security does. Now, I'll live life as it comes. What about your fantasies when you were a kid growing up on the streets? What did you think, what did you see yourself doing when you were so-called grown up and adult? What, what were you thinking about being back then? Well, I was going to follow in a relative's footsteps. I think I was going to be a psychiatrist. I know that was one of the reasons why I pursued uh, uh, psychology in school. Which relative is that? It's uh, Dr. Kotsos, who works out of New York. He's an uncle? He's an uncle. He's an uncle. So and he started... He's a great me. man. He started out to be a psychiatrist. And no, really. I started out to be a cowboy like uh, Roy Rogers. <laughs> oh, you weren't going to... Then I wanted to be a fireman. Then I wanted to be a policeman. And then you want to be a movie star. But these things are quickly dismissed. And then all of a sudden you're thrown into this lollipop land and you become them all inside of a couple of years where I've been anything you want to be. What Excuse is... me while I go for the... No, sure. The London water, the best. Tell us a little bit about uh, your grandfather, a man who had 27 children and started at age 50. Well, <laughs> that was his problem. You know. What was he trying to prove? Let me tell you about one of his progeny, and that was my father. All right. Okay. My father, boy, what a hero he would have been. He was my hero. That's my great hero, my old man. He was a guy, none of us took after him, you know. If any of us had the spark that was the flame of Nicholas Savalas, we'd be the greatest man in the world today. The greatest razzle-dazzle man that ever lived. He was a millionaire a couple of times, a pauper three times, and never the middle of the road kind of a guy who, you know, all of a sudden we're in a private school in Connecticut. 
And all his kids are dragged out of school. And he puts us in the back of a truck. And he's peddling cakes on the streets of New York as if nothing happened. But what had happened? He lost all his bread, but it didn't make any difference. Because what was wealthy and what was valuable, he had in the back of his car. And he was a fun trip. And that's where it's at, baby. Would you take a moment to tell us about the accident that got you into being an actor? Because it was at the time that you were working at the State Department, and you had no ambitions to be an actor, no dreams or no illusions, and yet you've become a highly successful one. The accident? Let's see. I got a call from a theatrical agent needing some personality to play on a television show called the Armstrong Circle Theater. They needed an old judge and they wanted someone with a documentary accent. So uh, I had the guy and I called him and he wasn't home. But in order to satisfy diplomacy and protocol, I, I went to get this woman off the hook. I went there with my phony accent, that, that. What was the accent? What was the oh, character? I don't, I don't remember. I mean, was it a European character or a Spanish type character? What kind I, did they want? Do you remember? I don't remember what kind I threw on them. You know, but I just you... went in with my struggling English and uh, didn't tell him I was an American. And sure enough, they said, uh, you're a little young, but would you do it? I didn't say yes right away, because then I thought I was getting in deep. Even though I am my father's son, I figured I had to investigate a little bit more, get some reassurance. So that night, I asked my mother. I said, Ma, they're going to pay me $200 for doing this scene. What do you think? Tell you. You do it, you'd be a glorious actor. So I did it as a total gag and uh, haven't looked back since. Well, how did, how did the next part come? I mean, you were very successful in that. You were very highly credible. Then did you decide, well, I'm going to leave the State Department and become no, an actor? No, 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 no. Then the producer, we had a talk. He wanted to know how long I'd been an actor. I told him three days. The next show they put me in was the lead, the Armstrong Circle Theater again. You know, running around from scene to scene. Yeah. And live TV. Live, live drama. TV with speeches you couldn't believe. Which came easy enough, learning the speeches. And, and I never got nervous because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Until the night of the broadcast when the director yells, Two minutes! And there's the camera on me just like now. <laughs> and I'm getting ready like that. Two minutes, getting ready. And I couldn't think of the first word. And I began to panic because I had long speeches and changing of clothes. Now, if I forget one of the peaches, what do I do? Uh, uh, say, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is really not my ball game. You see, I'm with the State Department, and they just hired me for this, and I probably could go on for an hour, <laughs> but I didn't know there was any precedence for that. Yeah. But then I remember my father, his philosophy from Roosevelt to me, it's all a racket, and I was all right. <laughs> and we went through it. Then I was spotted in Hollywood, and I made the Birdman of Alcatraz. And then they got the Academy Awards that year. And one of my name, my name is on one of the list. I couldn't believe it all. What led to your shaving of your head? Picture called The Greatest Story Ever Told, where George Stevens, another great talent who was recently passed away, wanted me to play Porteous Pilot. OK, and he said, uh, um, you know, Telly, forget Mr. Savalas. One of the great things about George Stevens, although he probably was the most renowned director in the world, he called me Mr. Savalas, gave me a dressing room with a big star on it, all the conceits of being a movie actor. And I loved him for it. It's Mr. Savalas, he says, forget about how you uh, conceived Pontius Pilate in the past, but it would give me a feeling of power, a feeling of, uh, because the man was a governor and a general, and he ruled the land with an iron fist. I'd like to shave your head. How do you feel about that? I says, I don't mind. I says, I'm free of any feeling. I, but I do have small children at home. <laughs> Who may be afraid of me. Who, uh, you know, yeah. uh, not afraid of me, but it might be traumatic for them, for mm -hmm. Papa to come home <laughs> looking so different. Yeah. He says, well, why don't you bring them in, and we, well, they'll watch the ceremony. I says, it's a good idea. So I brought my kids in, my nieces and nephews in. I brought the whole neighborhood in. They never even noticed. They didn't? I mean, they noticed me shame, but they couldn't care less. Really? And the next picture was waiting, and the next picture was waiting, and I could never let it grow. So I figured, well, it's comfortable this way. Just a lot more face to shave. 
<laughs> Other than that, uh, the back of your face, you now you have to shave. Yeah, just keep going with the razor. But what about maintenance of your head? What, uh, what do you do? Do you shave with electric razor? I'm all gone. You don't wax it or anything like that? Do I look like the kind of guy who's going to wax my head? I don't. <laughs> but an interesting it looks thing about shiny the greatest sometimes. story I ever told, that I love this story. It's all right, I was cast for the picture. And as you know, it was a story of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So I call my mother in New York and tell her, Mom, I'm going to still be in Hollywood. You know, it wasn't a fluke, you know. They didn't make a mistake. They really wanted me to be there for the Birdman. And now the greatest story ever told, Mom, I'm going to be in that picture. Telly, she says, that's wonderful. You'll make a great Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what did you have to tell her then? Hey, Ma, I'm playing Pontius Pilate. Well, there was a dramatic pause on the other side. And then she says, well, all right, Telly, but make sure you play him sympathetically. This is a gorgeous blue sky day here. What about... I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> Do you feel like a bat? But I love the English. You know why I love the English? Because when you get a sunny, or when it's raining, they'll say something like, blimey, it's raining. <laughs> As if it doesn't rain in England. And then with the sunny day, they're just the attitude they have, which I loved before. But no, when it's sun shining in England or in London, it upsets me. Why? Because it uh, destroys the image. It should be kind of a foggy day in London, of course, like the song said. That's what Frank said. But what do you do at night? I mean, there are a lot of things you do at night, but what are some of the, the special places you're drawn to here in London at night? Participate in it all. You know, London, as I say, is one of my favorite places in all the world. It's They speak my language, almost. <laughs> I hope my wife don't hear that. And uh, the restaurants, the total spirit of the city and of the English. You know, in the face of adversity, they're the most courageous people alive. The company, or the country, they say, is going down the tubes. Let me tell you something. If it goes down the tubes, it's going to do it with style. And you'll probably go with it. Of course I will. Dragging them back up. But it you do it all here. They have gambling casinos. I like to gamble. <laughs> Thank you. Stick around, driver. You we'll replaced your Volkswagen, huh? Oh, what's happened? Night, bridge, sporting clown. That's where we're headed. Uh -huh. yeah, really me. So, uh, this is one of the places where you prowl around at night, huh? Hello, Bill. Hello, Charlie. How are you? Alex. A couple of the owners. The owners? Yes. Gotta keep on good terms with them. It's a nice first sporting club. What are the hours on a place like this? How late does it stay open? Unlike places like Las Vegas or uh, wherever else they gamble, this closes at 4 o'clock, except on Saturdays, they close at 3. Figure that one out. And this is a private club? All these people playing here are members? Private club. Everybody's a member. You, <laughs> you got to join a club to do your brains. Tell us about the story of Telly's pop. I mean, people now have the impression, I think, that Telly Savalas is a big horse man. That yeah. Telly Savalas is a guy who knows all about horses. That's yeah, not sure. true, is it? Telly Savalas is a one-horse stable, and that's <laughs> Telly's pop. But that one-horse stable is the greatest horse in the world. He's from the point of thrills he's given us. Yeah, a friend of mine, Howard Koch, you know, he wanted me to get into racing. I dismissed him. Finally, he tells me, you know, there's a little baby on the farm and my trainer's in trouble. He needs six thousand dollars. Let's go three thousand apiece. Get Howard off my back. I gave him the three thousand dollars. But there's a little baby on a farm that nobody wanted. A real ugly duckling. You really just did it because of a favor to a friend not to buy a horse for two. Right. But if I'm gonna be in a business here, yeah, price is right. Who buys horses for three thousand dollars? Right? Anyway, I went down to visit the horse after some seven months. He's getting close to two years old and getting ready to race. What are we gonna call him, Telly? I looked at the horse and I called him Telly's Pop. Why? Because my pop took me my first race at Belmont, and I saw a whirl away. So what are you going to call a horse? It's a male Telly's pop. It was a natural. The day I named him kid, it was like rubbing the the magic, uh, what is that thing the genies come out of? Uh, lamp. lamp. Magic, magic lamp. lamp. Thank you very much. You know, you're very <laughs> guilty. I, I know my four-letter work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I rubbed the magic lamp, and a genie came out, and something happened, and this horse grew into a monster. His first race, right? We go to Hollywood Park. Everybody's coming up to me and saying, we're going to bet on your horse, Telly. I begin to worry. You know, all these working stiffs laying their bet down. But it's Telly's, Telly's horse. Yeah, but it's Telly's horse. It's got to be something. And I'm worried stiff. The race starts. And they're off. 
And it's Straw Boss in a gap of three lengths. It's Razzle Dazzle, followed by Cornish Prince. And the last horse is Telly's Pop. And at the three-quarter pole, it's still Straw Boss and uh, Cornish Prince and Razzle Dazzle. And I'm a Garma whatever I am. And Telly's Pop. <laughs> coming into the stretch. Wait a second, what are you thinking at this point? Well, I figured the expected. That's horse racing, right? Yeah. I'm dying. A little bit embarrassed. Everybody's looking at me. <laughs> that is straw boss at Telly. And here comes Telly's pop. Billy, with two furlongs to go, this horse comes in and wins by three lanes. I look at Howard Koch's lips are purple. <laughs> I say to myself, what do we do from here? We got to retire the horse. Suffice to say, he went on to win the Triple Crown for two-year-olds. First time in the history of California racing. How about the feminist movement? How do you relate to the, the strivings of women for... I'm all for give them what they want. Give it to them. What do you want, honey? It's yours. But I've been that way all my life. But how do you explain these silly women? If all your life you're giving 100%, they want it now 50-50. Does that make sense to you? What do you want, darling? It's yours. So you're all for women totally. doctors, what do, what do women educators, whatever. Total yeah. equal opportunity. I'll be right back with more of Telly Savalas in just a moment. Have any psychic abilities? ESP? Can I tell you one frightening story? Sure. Now, being trained in, if you will, the empirical method and everything has to make s sense. But I had an experience, let's see, 20 some odd years ago, going out to Long Island, and I lived in Garden City after a date. <laughs> I'm going out to Long Island and I run out of gas, and I'm always doing that. I never carry any money. I run out of gas. It's, four, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. And I don't know, in Jamaica on Hillside Avenue, there's a white tower there. And I go in there, where's there a gas station over? They say the Cross Island Parkway. All right. If you walk through the woods there and get on the parkway. So I start walking through the woods. Hey, every word is true here. Every word is true. And I hear a voice say, I'll give you a lift. Turn around. There's a guy sitting in a Cadillac. I didn't hear the car. And I thought he was a little fag, if you will. You know, for the sound of his voice. I figured, well, I'll take my chance as I go in. I tell him I ran out of gas. He drives me to the gas station. And before I can get out, he says, I'll lend you a dollar. Now, I didn't tell him I didn't have any money. But, uh, and I tell him, look, I'm a responsible man, and I work for our government. Would you give me your address on a piece of paper? And then I'll, uh, I'll send you the dollar, and thank you. He's not, uh, please, and I insisted. And so while he's writing his name and address on a piece of paper, I go get my gallon of gas. When I get it back, he says, I'll drive you back to your car. It's very nice. We're driving along. It's true. Every word is true. I know, it's entertain. True. And he says in the strangest voice I've ever heard, I'm only gonna tell you half the story. He says, I know. I won't mention the name. I say, who's that? He says, well, he's a utility infielder for the Boston Red Sox. I felt that so bizarre, because we weren't talking baseball. I said, oh, really? OK, very nice. Takes me to my car, put the gas in the car, he pushes my car, gets started. Everything's wonderful. Thank you very much. All in all, a very pleasant experience, right? Sure. Next day, I'm coming out of my office, and we had the Journal American then. There's the headline, so-and-so dead age 20, dies under very mysterious circumstances in Boston, time of death, 3.30 in the morning, the exact time this guy was saying, I know so-and-so. I got chills. How do you figure it? What was it? That's not the end of the story. Keep going. That's not at the end of half the story. Because if I told you the rest of it, it'd blow your mind. No, go ahead. I look at this, and I say, gee, what a horrible coincidence that is. You know, how is it? Anyway, I go home. And my mother, who I told you about, besides being very beautiful and very talented and very artistic, my mother's also a witch. <laughs> I say, Ma, you know what happened to me last night in the morning? You know, this fella here picked me up and he mentioned this guy's name at the exact time this fella died up in Boston. She says, Telly, life is full of all kinds of mysteries, all very sensible for her. Then I remember that piece of paper. I go into the closet, 
take out the piece of paper. Sure enough, there's his name, there's his address, and unsolicited, there's a telephone number. I'm gonna call him, Ma. I'm gonna call him. Guy gets on the phone, Jimmy's bar. I say, may I speak to Mr. Cullen, please? All true. You hear me, Billy? Uh, just a minute. A lady gets on the phone. Uh, yes, can I help you? Yeah, can I speak to Mr. Cullen? He's not here. I, what are you expecting? Well, I was with him last night, he, and he, he led me to believe that I could reach him at this address. Oh, really? What do he look like? I begin to describe him. She breaks out into tears and says, I don't know what a, kind of a trick this is, you dirty bastard. But you're talking about my husband, and he's been dead for three years. How did you feel when she said that? Still not the end of the story. Oh, wow. I apologized. I says, obviously, there's some mistake, and, but I couldn't get over this. I made a rendezvous with her four days, and I met her in, uh, in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. We had lunch, and I'm not going to tell her that I was unnerved or anything. To make a long story short, the clothes I described were the clothes he was buried in. I described them to a T, except for the voice. She said he had a deep voice like yours. But no, this voice was very high and effeminate. And he wrote a letter when he was in the Army. And outside of Jimmy Cullen in her letter and James Cullen on my piece of paper, the handwriting was identical, and there was no question that this man committed suicide three years before. How do you figure that out? That's half the story. Next time, I might tell you the other half. What a story. But it's scary. It's scary. That's the only experience. I, why me? I'm not interested in nonsense like that. But it's unnerved me, and it still does. Have you had any recurring dreams all your life? What does that mean? Well, you know, something, a dream that you maybe had it, you know, once a year or a couple times a year. I had a dream last night that I won a lot of money.